The world we live in today was born the moment World War II ended. At this moment, the entire world was gazing upon an open road from which many futures were possible. This auspicious opportunity to forge a new, global future was made possible by the world's reaction to the crisis that had just occurred. The crisis, in this story, is the entire period ranging from the outbreak of World War I, to the Great Depression, to the rise of fascism, and finally the conclusion of World War II. The combination of two world wars with a global depression in between amounted to 31 years in history and one huge catastrophic sequence of events that created the space for new ideas to displace the old. In other words, the crisis created an opportunity for a paradigm shift of global society. The shift that took place was a reimagining of how governments and economies ought to interact and how governments and economies across the world ought to engage in economic and political cooperation. The preceding paradigm, which can be described as a competitive market society combined with a representative democracy, was based on the tenets of classical liberalism. Society, according to classical liberal capitalists, was ideally comprised of a limited government, whose two main functions were to protect its citizenry from attack by foreign entities and to enshrine individual liberty by facilitating the operation of free markets, which would provide the vast majority of resources and services to individual citizens throughout their lives. The government was a tool whose influence over the lives of normal people was preferably mitigated at every opportunity. The balance between the influence of the government and the freedom of the market was, and still is, one of the evergreen issues at the heart of all liberal philosophy. Unfortunately, the classical liberal paradigm eventually began to decay. The global gold standard system began to create barriers to productive cooperation between nations, which resulted in political tensions that exploded into violent conflict. The laissez-faire approach to the market under the limited state was eventually confounded by economic depressions with no obvious policy remedies, and the proliferation of unsound economic behavior that thrived in a laissez-faire environment. Most tragically, the economic misery and inequality experienced by the average citizen contrasted sharply with the promise of freedom, peace, and tranquility offered by representative democracy. Economic conditions were now identified as major causes of injustice, deprivation, and death in society, and naturally begged for political solutions that deviated from classical liberal capitalism and sometimes from democracy itself. Thus, the space was created for a titanic struggle to establish the next economic and political paradigm that would follow liberal capitalism. The set of ideas that could most powerfully articulate how economics and politics should interact was the key to capturing the future, and no political philosophy could possibly abstain. Ideas like communism, socialism, and fascism began to fill the void in nations that could not reconcile the contradictions of capitalism or bear the weight of monarchy or imperial colonization any longer. While some of them wanted to preserve democracy, others decided that if liberal capitalism had failed, then maybe democracy was part of the problem too. World War II was the physical culmination of this struggle. And when this struggle finally concluded, the paradigm that did emerge from the rubble of this 31-year crisis was, remarkably, yet another form of liberal capitalism. This result was primarily influenced by the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. During the crisis period, Keynes's writings articulated a powerful case for enabling central governments to take active measures to mitigate the effects of severe economic depressions. Keynes's innovation in liberalism allowed the combination of a competitive market society imbued with reverence for representative democracy to be preserved, while discarding laissez-faire, the gold standard system, and the necessity of limited government. This paradigm came to be referred to as the post-war consensus, and is most accurately represented by the Western activist governments led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Clement Attlee. Globally, the post-war consensus was also represented by the Bretton Woods International Monetary System, whose institutions would not only rebuild society, but attempt to keep national governments from slipping back into pre-war conditions. Much later in the 20th century, this period in history was powerfully summarized by the label embedded liberalism. But though it may be accurate to say that the modern world lives in the shadow of World War II, clearly we don't live under post-war embedded liberalism anymore. The more precise answer is that the modern world lives in the shadow of the decades immediately following World War II. These three decades, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, were the critical years that would determine the fate of Keynes's evolution of liberalism and the path leading away from a conflict whose devastation still remains unsurpassed to this day. Though the war was officially over on September 2, 1945, six years and one day after it began, 
the ideological war which undergirded the conflict never ended. The United States and the Soviet Union, who had cooperated to crush the Axis powers, saw their partnership quickly dissolve after their shared enemy was defeated. What ensued was a period of simmering hostility, suspicion, and espionage between two unrivaled superpowers that figuratively and literally represented the struggle between capitalism and communism. And because these competing visions of society were fighting in a post-war world, a world where global reconstruction was paramount and large-scale international warfare was to be avoided at all costs, the conflict manifested as a Cold War. The significance of the Cold War period cannot be overstated. It is arguably more influential than the embedded liberal era itself. The Cold War extended at least a decade beyond the end of embedded liberalism and would continue dominating global affairs until the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991, but arguably even further beyond that. However, the simultaneous emergence of both embedded liberal capitalism and the Cold War in 1945 thrusted the world into a paradoxical moment. At the very same time that a newer, more socially democratic form of liberal capitalism had just reached its height in the developed world, the Cold War threw cold water on that movement. Not long after the war, Western leaders declared the need to contain the spread of communism emanating from the Soviet Union. The USSR, which infamously rejected participation in the Bretton Woods system, was feared to be capable of expanding its influence into any nation caught unprepared. Countries around the world, but especially the United States, began focusing intense suspicion inwards as they scanned for communist infiltrators. The eventual outbreak of proxy wars between these two superpowers and the frantic stockpiling of nuclear weaponry introduced the possibility that at any moment this Cold War could escalate into the instantaneous, mutually assured destruction of all life on Earth. The sum of these threats created an atmosphere of omnipresent tension that birthed a paranoid style of politics in the developed world and casted a chilling effect on the abilities of national governments to uphold the goals of embedded liberalism without being conflated with totalitarian communist domination. But arguably, the Cold War's most pernicious effect was to obscure yet another conflict that was taking place simultaneously, the conflict that is the real focus of this series. That conflict is the one between the economic and political paradigm of the post-war world and a furtive economic ideology known as neoliberalism. See, while the world was glued to the narrative of capitalism and communism's struggle for dominance, relatively little attention was paid to capitalism's war against itself. Despite being two flavors of liberal capitalism, the neoliberal version would never be satisfied until the embedded liberal version was exiled from power. The confusing and unsettling atmosphere that permeated the year 1945 and beyond provided the opportunity for neoliberalism to launch an unanticipated and understudied intellectual counter-revolution whose aim was to slowly displace the post-war consensus over the course of decades. This period, ranging from approximately 1945 to 1981, constitutes the second major phase of neoliberal history and is marked by three specific developments. The first development was the evolution of neoliberalism into unique branches of thought. While neoliberalism in the 1930s and early 40s was a sometimes ambiguous and amorphous figure, leaning heavily on general concepts of individual liberty, competition, and anti-collectivism, Neoliberalism post-1946 developed in two noticeable directions. The first was the neoliberalism that was shared by the first generation of the University of Chicago economists and the German Ordo Liberal economists, headquartered in Freiburg, who tasked the state with overseeing competition while still placing value on social safety nets and anti-monopoly protections. The Ordo Liberal strand was implemented in post-war West Germany in the early 1950s to great effect, and the subsequent economic recovery of West Germany was dubbed Wirtschaftswunder or economic miracle. The second strand of neoliberalism was concocted by the Austrians, along with the second generation of the Chicago School, who opted to completely recast politics and society in general as one massive, elaborate, thinly veiled market process that reduced human beings into rational utility maximizers. However, this was merely a highly sophisticated intellectual veneer to obscure a much simpler premise which was to return economic and political power into the hands of a capitalist class that was in retreat due to the post-war consensus. By producing writing that designated politics as just another realm for economic rationality to conquer, the new Chicago neoliberalism created a philosophical feedback loop that justified producing research at the behest of wealthy interests who were seeking an intellectual case for recapturing the political system. It was the epitome of a short-term tactic masquerading as deep philosophical inquiry. 
In stark contrast to their ultra-liberal colleagues, the new Chicago school redefined corporations, monopolies, and oversized trusts as, at best, benign entities, whose excesses would be passively corrected by a self-regulating, self-healing competitive system, or, at worst, the dismal result of some nefarious state intervention on behalf of an unscrupulous special interest, like a labor union. The new Chicago school's neoliberalism also carried a philosophical offshoot called public choice theory, which extended neoliberal market logic into all sorts of non-market contexts, including law, government, and the public sector. In this way, neoliberalism formed an epistemological sinkhole underneath all other styles of governance. Though the ordo-liberal model achieved a notable success in West Germany, it was the new Chicago school's flavor of neoliberalism that would have a much bigger impact on world history. Unlike the German model, the new Chicago model would not be deliberately implemented in the economic policy of any nation until 1973, under the dictator Augusto Pinochet in Chile. But despite the horrific results found in Chile, this aggressive strain of neoliberalism still infiltrated the political systems of the United States and the United Kingdom by the end of the decade, finally escaping the margins of political thought where it had been slowly building since the end of World War II and entering the halls of power. It has since become the dominant economic paradigm of global society, successfully displacing the post-war embedded liberal system that came before. It is for this reason that when I use the term neoliberalism, I am referring specifically to the Chicago strand of neoliberalism rather than the ordoliberal variation. Each of these strands, the ordoliberal, the neoliberal, and public choice variations were all products of the Mont Pelerin Society led by Friedrich Hayek, whose aim was to build a transatlantic network of interdisciplinary pro-market academics and business conservatives based in Europe and America. The development of this international network of neoliberal activists constitutes the second major development of the period. Academics, business leaders, journalists, and politicians all worked in tandem to establish free market capitalism as a legitimate policy alternative to the post-war consensus. The academic faction would produce neoliberal research in prestigious university departments, often with wealthy benefactors paying their salaries directly rather than the university itself. The business faction would then amplify that research through its recently established think tank network, which not only published this research prolifically, but also connected neoliberal academics with sympathetic politicians and journalists by hosting prestigious research conferences. A short list of the historic players in the neoliberal think tank network includes some of the most well-known think tanks in Europe and America, including the American Enterprise Institute, the Foundation for Economic Education, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Center for Policy Studies, and the Adam Smith Institute. The avalanche of activity generated by this network eventually succeeded in the creation of an enormously important cultural accolade, the Nobel Peace Prize in Economic Sciences. The prize was established through a donation to the Nobel Foundation by the Central Bank of Sweden in 1968, 67 years after the first Nobel Prizes were awarded in 1901. To date, the prize has been awarded to at least a dozen members of the Second Chicago School, including at least five former presidents of the Mont Pelerin Society. The third major development of the period was the gradual adoption of neoliberal economics by the conservative parties of the US and the UK. The conservative parties of both of these countries found themselves on the defensive following the New Deal in America and the groundbreaking alley reforms in Britain. Public programs like Social Security, the National Health Service, and other enduring examples of government activism were emblematic of the period. These social reforms were so popular and well entrenched that even the conservative administrations which followed them, specifically Eisenhower in the US and Churchill in the UK, were uninterested in attempting to roll them back. However, the conservative business elite viewed their unambitious leaders with disdain and sought out neoliberal scholars such as Hayek to devise a way to fight government interventionism and regain their control over labor. Through their collaboration, they created a potent stream of economic propaganda that flowed into the radical grassroots activism building against the conservative establishment. This was the era of Joseph McCarthy, the John Birch Society, Wallace and Goldwater, all of whom were attempting to resist the many societal transformations taking place in the post-war era. Despite their radical new conception of liberalism, neoliberals frequently claimed classical liberals such as Adam Smith and David Hume as their own which created the appearance of a historical lineage that extended backwards before the 20th century and the rush towards collectivism. This appeal to tradition proved powerfully seductive to conservative parties, and in neoliberal economics, conservatism found the engine for its mid-century offensive. Though it required a fusion with the new conservative priorities, such as stalwart anti-communism, reverence for Judeo-Christian teachings, 
opposition to civil rights for non-white persons, heteronormative and patriarchal family structures, and anti-immigrant sentiment, neoliberalism successfully injected adrenaline into the downtrodden right-wing movements that had been struggling to assert their relevance since the Great Depression. Eventually, decades later, the combination of apocalyptic Cold War paranoia and tenacious economic stagflation created a sufficient crisis for conservatives armed with neoliberal tools to present a binary political choice between free market and in fact neoliberal capitalism and totalitarian communism with no room for any form of embedded liberal capitalism in between. This led to massive electoral victories at the very end of the 1970s when the post-war consensus was finally collapsing. Only the first development will be covered in this video. These three developments in the evolution of neoliberal capitalism, which took place in the shadow of the Cold War, were events with global repercussions. They were also events which, incredibly, went mostly unnoticed or ignored by the political and economic mainstreams of the time. And if they were acknowledged, they were never identified as neoliberal developments, but either as conservative or libertarian ones. The unhelpful dichotomy between liberals and conservatives that has persisted in our political discourse from the post-war era to the present day made the task of identifying neoliberalism's proximity to both conservatism and libertarianism extremely difficult. Additionally, the existence of different philosophical variants of neoliberalism, one of which actually did deliver positive economic recovery in West Germany, made the task of identifying the danger inherent in later forms of neoliberalism even more difficult. Under the cover of this widespread economic and political obfuscation, the indefatigable persistence of neoliberal champions like Hayek and others redirected the course of economics, politics, and history itself away from the conclusions drawn by Keynes and the social reformers of the early 20th century and towards a new ontology of a society indistinguishable from a market process. Shortly after the conclusion of the Cold War, some thinkers even went as far as to say that the current neoliberal capitalist paradigm constituted the end of history. A greater testament to neoliberalism's assiduous dedication to the knowledge war is difficult to imagine. In order to understand how neoliberalism supplanted the post-war consensus in the three decades immediately following World War II, we must now investigate the evolution of neoliberal thought during the post-war period, which would one day achieve a neoliberal revolution in approximately 1981. The year 1945 was among the most consequential years in world history. On April 12th, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt died, and his Vice President Harry S. Truman was sworn in that evening in the White House. On May 2nd, the Red Army declared that Berlin had fallen, and the Nazi regime was defeated. On July 26th, Clement Attlee was elected as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, with the first labor majority in the House of Commons in the party's history. On August 6th, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and then on Nagasaki three days later. The United Nations Charter was ratified by 29 nations on October 24th, bringing the United Nations into existence. World War II officially ended on September 2nd, with the surrender of the last Japanese fighters, and the twin eras of embedded liberalism and the Cold War were born. 1945 was also a critical year for the nascent neoliberal movement. Only one year before, Friedrich Hayek published his surprise hit in economic philosophy, The Road to Serfdom, which was a solemn warning against the turn towards government intervention that was threatening the very foundations of Western society. The book made Hayek into the de facto leader of a previously disconnected network of individuals who were convinced that the incoming post-war paradigm was far too dangerous to substitute for proper liberal capitalism. By 1947, Hayek organized the first ever meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, which brought various factions of intellectuals and businessmen of different nationalities into one group to defend the competitive market system from the existential threats to it they perceived. As we know, the neoliberals agreed on certain basic criteria, but were not an intellectual monolith from the start. There were different strands within neoliberal thought, represented by different thinkers from different nations, who saw themselves as part of a larger movement to evolve liberalism, but not in the way Keynes had done. One important and under-examined group of intellectuals among these various factions was the German ordo-liberal economists of the Freiburg School. The ordo-liberals were a group within the larger neoliberal movement that complicate the origin story of modern neoliberalism in the 20th century. Some of the more important ordo-liberal figures included Walter Eucken, Franz Boom, Ludwig Erhard, Alexander Rousteau, Wilhelm Rapke, Alfred Muller Armack, and Leonard Mich. This group developed a significant body of knowledge in the mid and late 1930s that notably contrasted with both Keynesian liberalism 
and later versions of neoliberalism that emerged after 1950. Crucially, the Ordo Liberal Group was the first neoliberal group to implement its proposals in a post war setting, which it did in the Federal Republic of Germany, otherwise known as West Germany, between 1948 and 1966. Many of these Ordo Liberals were members of Hayek's Montpellerin Society and were highly respected due to their perseverance during the Nazis' rule and their influence over post war Germany. One of the most important Ordo Liberals was Ludwig Erhard, a renowned German statesman and Montpellerin member who was elected to the government of West Germany in the first free elections following the Nazis. Erhard served as West Germany's Minister of Economic Affairs from 1949 to 1962, during which he oversaw a long period of low inflation and rapid industrial growth. Beginning in the early 1950s, Western media began to refer to this strong recovery as Wirtschaftswunder, or the economic miracle, and the recovery served as an important ideological victory for capitalism early in the Cold War. Erhard's popularity as economic minister helped him become Chancellor of West Germany in 1963, where he served for three years. Among the many important ideas which differentiate order liberals like Erhard from other neoliberals is a uniquely order liberal concept called the social market economy. Like basic neoliberalism, the social market economy is a societal framework that affirms the state's role to ensure a competitive order based on individual liberty and to discourage policies it perceives as anti-competitive. However, Unlike basic neoliberalism, the social market economy regarded as necessary the means to promote social cohesion in the face of industrial society's disruptions. Emerging social ills stemming from industrial mass society, things like overpopulation, rapid urbanization, economic stratification, and entangling bureaucracy, all contributed to the social and psychological destabilization of the working class and preceded moral and spiritual crises. Through an odd mixture of social science and metaphysics, the Ordo Liberals attempted to bake a sociological protection into capitalist society, the Ordo. The Ordo Liberals were aware that classical liberals had inflated the importance of the market economy. Wilhelm Rapke observed that the market economy was a narrow sector of societal life only that also required an anthropological sociological frame, otherwise capitalist society would begin to disintegrate. Alexander Rousteau considered it crucial to understand the superior importance of the vital and the anthropological, even within the economy, compared to technically economic aspects, which can be quantitatively measured. The ordo, or natural order, was an unscientific or even quasi-religious concept that was nonetheless meant to introduce balance and stability into the capitalist system. It was an idea born from the social ills that had sunk the Weimar Republic and opened a void for the Nazis. Despite being a somewhat anti-modern concept, the ordo was a genuine attempt to acknowledge the destructive potential of a capitalist market economy on the lives of human beings. It represented the Ordo Liberals' sincere efforts to protect the working class after the Great Depression, but without resorting to redistribution, welfare statism, or central planning. Ironically, Ordo Liberalism anticipated the need to re-embed markets into liberal capitalism, but with a completely different economic vocabulary. One of the most important ways that the philosophy of the Ordo was translated into real policy was the Ordo Liberal position on monopoly power. Even though the social market economy was still fiercely committed to a competitive system, Order liberal competition policy was straightforwardly intolerant of monopolies and oversized trusts. The concentration of economic power inherent to monopolies was precisely the type of social ill that could destabilize the working class and disturb the so-called ordo of a capitalist society. On this issue, the order liberals found common ground with another group of scholars within the neoliberal movement, the first generation of the University of Chicago economists, which included figures such as Frank Knight, Jacob Viner, and Aaron Director but especially the renowned Chicago scholar Henry Simons. Born in 1899, Henry Calvert Simons was a student of Knight, and he achieved a similar stature to his mentor at Chicago. Though Simons didn't have any attachment to mystical notions of Ordo keeping capitalism together, he voiced a remarkably adversarial stance towards monopolistic and oligarchic power from within the confines of classical liberalism in his famous essay, A Positive Program for Laissez-Faire, from 1934. Simons declared, Thus, the great enemy of democracy is monopoly, in all its forms. Gigantic corporations, trade associations and other agencies for price control, trade unions, or, in general, organization and concentration of power within functional classes. Simons was one of the few liberal intellectuals in America who placed the Great Depression squarely at the feet of monopoly power. His positive program was an inspiration to founding order liberal figures such as Eucken, Simons was even required reading in some German economics programs in 1950. On the issue of monopolies, 
there was significant agreement between the German Ordos and the first-generation Chicago economists. For the duration of the 1930s and early 1940s, anti-monopoly protections were still a standard component of neoliberal thinking. But beginning in 1945, all of that would change. As we know, in early 1945, Friedrich Hayek embarked on an American book tour promoting his new work in economic philosophy, The Road to Serfdom. The unexpected success of The Road to Serfdom in March 1944 subsequently led to an American edition of the book published by University of Chicago Press that September. However, the real boom for Hayek came when Max Eastman of Reader's Digest published a condensed version of the book in April 1945. The condensation was released while Hayek was actually mid-journey to the United States for what he believed would be an easy trip of low-key academic lectures. But by the time he arrived, his tour had been taken over by a professional promotion company hired by University of Chicago Press. Using the Quadrangle Club at the University of Chicago as his home base, Hayek traveled to neighboring cities and states and spoke to audiences that sometimes numbered in the thousands. At one of these speaking events, on April 23, 1945, at the Economic Club in Detroit, Hayek's presentation caught the attention of a crucially important figure, who would become one of the most committed business allies for the early neoliberal movement in America. That man was named Harold Leno. Born in 1895, Leno was a Baptist businessman from Kansas City, Missouri, who had spent his youth as a cattle herder on a ranch and held a degree in animal husbandry and agricultural studies from Kansas State University. Leno served in the U.S. Army before returning to Kansas City to join his uncle's business in 1919. Leno was the nephew of William Volker, a wildly successful German entrepreneur who sold home furnishings through his Kansas City company, William Volker & Company, founded in 1882. By 1906, Volker's thriving business made him a millionaire, and Volker, who described himself as a progressive and a Christian socialist, began giving away his fortune anonymously to the residents of Kansas City. Volker eventually used his multi-million dollar fortune to create a philanthropic fund in 1932, called the William Volker Charities Fund, to continue aggressively seeking out opportunities to donate anonymously to different charities and poverty relief programs in Kansas City. When Volker retired with ailing health in 1937, his nephew Harold took control of the company, and later the entire charities fund as well. Almost immediately, Leno began to repurpose his uncle's old business and charity fund away from its usual activities of providing relief to the needy of Kansas City, and towards the aggressive bankrolling of an intellectual and political movement to attack the New Deal and government intervention on a global scale. In April 1945, Leno was alerted by his friend and later Mont Pelerin member Lauren B. Miller to a public lecture taking place on the 23rd in Detroit by the newly famous Austrian economic thinker Friedrich Hayek. Leno, who had read the condensed form of the road to serfdom in Reader's Digest, eagerly attended. By the end, Leno was clamoring for a meeting with Hayek, and so Miller arranged two meetings on April 24th and 25th at the Quadrangle Club immediately after the Detroit lecture. In their meetings, Leno proposed to commission Hayek for an American Road to Serfdom, a book specifically geared to impart the overwhelming importance of the free enterprise system to a less scholarly American audience. Leno, as president of the William Volker Company, promised to underwrite the project. It was this fateful meeting between Hayek and Leno that sparked a decades-long twist and turn through history that would lead to the founding of the New Chicago School, the Mont Pelerin Society, the eventual publication of Capitalism and Freedom, with a byline by Milton Friedman, and the wholesale transformation of post-war neoliberalism into an explicitly pro-corporate creed. From this point on, Leno was the primary source of funding for Hayek and his emerging movement. Hayek eventually responded to Leno's proposal on May 3, 1945, and suggested Chicago as the potential site of the American Road Project. His suggestion was based on years of positive interactions with the first-generation Chicago economist Knight, Viner, Director, and Simons during his time at the LSC with Lionel Robbins. Of all these figures, however, Simons and Director were the ones who played the most dramatic roles in what was about to transpire at Chicago. Born in 1901, Aaron Director entered graduate studies at the University of Chicago in 1927. Ten years later, Director sailed to England to write his dissertation for Jacob Viner, where he made contact with Hayek, Robbins, and Arnold Plant at the LSC. Director returned to the United States in 1939 to serve the government during wartime, and then remained in Washington, D.C. rather than returning to Chicago. The year prior, in 1938, Director's sister, Rose Director, married Milton Friedman, becoming Rose Friedman, and making Friedman Director's brother-in-law. After returning to America, 
the rector proved himself to be one of Hayek's most steadfast academic and political allies in the United States. It was the rector who convinced University of Chicago Press to republish The Road to Serfdom in the U.S. when several other publishing houses had refused to do so. Hayek's entire U.S. book tour, and the events it precipitated, were direct results of director's advocacy for Hayek. Director followed the book's publication with his own review, stating, There is no economist writing in English more eminently qualified to do this job of exploring the ultimate political implications of abandoning the competitive system. In addition to his repute as an economist, Professor Hayek is our most accomplished historian of the development of economic ideas. With Leno's support, Hayek, Simons, Director, and the University of Chicago's Chancellor Robert Hutchins successfully proposed the creation of a program at the University of Chicago's law school called the Free Market Study. The program was meant to deliver what Leno wanted, a free enterprise Bible for the average American, by installing Director in Chicago's law school as a permanently tenured professor supervising his choice of collaborators to produce original empirical research for the book. The program was eventually authorized in the summer of 1946, but not without a major casualty. Far from being an easy sell, the university actually initially denied authorization for the program after refusing to grant director permanent tenure after a five-year period, during which his salary would be paid in full by the William Volcker Fund. Simons, who desperately wanted to reunite with his friend Aaron Director to build a liberal institute, was so despaired by the decision that he took his own life shortly afterwards. To compound the tragedy, the university administration revealed afterwards that it had actually misunderstood the proposal and was ready to authorize the program, but without the promise of permanent tenure after five years. Director sought Hayek's guidance in the dilemma, and Hayek convinced Director to take the position despite the loss of Simons, making Hayek a crucial figure in the creation of the free market study and subsequently the entire Chicago school that sprouted out of the program. After successfully bringing the Volcker-funded free market study into existence in the summer of 1946, Hayek was now seeking a teaching position for himself in the United States. He had lived in Britain and worked at the LLC for many years, and who was finally ready to migrate to where he believed the neoliberal center of gravity was shifting, America. Deliberations to create a place for Hayek in the economics department at Chicago began in the fall of 1948, two years after the launch of the free market study. But ironically, Despite working so hard to bring the free market study to life, Hayek couldn't get the support he needed to enter the economics department. The road to serfdom was considered too popular of a work to risk identifying the department with it, but at the same time, they weren't opposed to finding another position for him at Chicago. Yet again, the combination of Leno and Hutchins engineered a solution by appointing Hayek to the Committee on Social Thought, an elite interdisciplinary PhD granting committee with a broad-based mission to oversee transdisciplinary scholarship. Previous appointments to the committee have included the writer T.S. Eliot and the political theorist Hannah Arendt, among other philosophers and historians. Hayek's appointment to the committee required only Hutchins' approval, and before long, Hayek accepted his Volcker-funded position at the Committee on Social Thought in 1950, where he would be able to supervise the free market study and all the neoliberal projects at Chicago that would follow. Director was now the head of the free market study, the privately funded centerpiece of the newly minted Chicago School which was, in fact, a conglomeration of the economics department, the law school, and the business school. The program's personnel, as was selected by director, comprised of Frank Knight, economics professor, Milton Friedman, economics professor and director's brother-in-law, Theodore Schultz, chair of the economics department, Edward Levi, law professor, Wilbur Katz, dean of the law school, and Garfield Cox, dean of the business school. Soon after the free market study commenced in 1946, the group decided that they would focus on the issue of monopoly power, perhaps in the memory of Henry Simons, or perhaps to reflect the interests of their sponsor, Harold Leno. The study operated from 1946 to 1952, during which several curious things occurred. The first was that Simons' anti-monopoly liberalism was actually still preserved up until around 1950, when each of the study's main participants, Director, Friedman, and Levi, underwent sharp rightward transformations on the issue of monopoly and corporations. The second curious thing was that the American Road book that Leno was seeking never actually materialized by the end of the five-year project. And yet, Leno's Volcker Fund agreed to bankroll yet another program at Chicago, ironically titled the Antitrust Project, with the same trio, Director, Friedman, and Levi, from 1953 to 1957. The span of these two Volcker-funded projects at Chicago constitute the window 
in which the second generation of the Chicago school deviated significantly from their older Chicago and order liberal colleagues on the issue of monopoly power and began propagating a new iteration of neoliberalism that completely omitted the danger of concentrated economic power. As we recall, Director, Knight, and Friedman were all present at the inaugural meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, which occurred slightly less than one year following the beginning of the free market study. Incidentally, travel to Switzerland for all the American attendees had been paid for by the Volcker Fund. At the meeting, Director and Friedman engaged with the German order liberals like Eucken and had no major disagreements about the danger posed by monopoly power. However, unbeknownst to many, the study's funder, Lano, had been steadily exerting control over the program's course since its inception. From the outset, Leno inserted his business allies Lauren Miller and Leonard Reed, who were also present at the Mont Pelerin meeting, to oversee the progress of the free market study. Like Miller and Leno, Reed was another key ally for the early neoliberal movement and was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, today considered one of the oldest libertarian organizations in the United States. Earlier in March 1946, Reed acquired a loan from the Volcker Fund to purchase a large property in Irvington, New York, which he transformed into the headquarters of the FEE. The FEE specialized in publishing books, articles, and pamphlets that unflinchingly championed the superiority of a free market society. Like Leno and Miller, Reed was also remarkably inflexible in his zeal for free market capitalism, and even criticized Simon's posthumously published Economic Policy for a Free Society in a letter to Director, who actually wrote the book's prefatory note. Some of us here have carefully gone over the galleys of Economic Policy for a Free Society by Henry Simons. We had hoped this was a piece we might assist in distributing, but it is so well loaded with the advocacy of collectivistic ideas that it falls entirely out of our field. The book states many positions with which we are in agreement, but personally, I do not believe that the cause of individual liberty and a free market economy will be aided by it. Figures like Leno, Reed, and Miller who were now thoroughly enmeshed in the pro-market academic research they were commissioning, had no use for the anti-monopoly liberalism of Simons. Like the neoliberals themselves, they wanted a reformulation of liberalism, but molded to meet the present moment. They wanted to compound the advantage of American corporations over the multitude of destroyed countries in the world. They approved of a strong state, as long as it was using its authority to enshrine competition and free enterprise. A strong American state and strong American corporations were the best weapons to fight collectivism at home and abroad during the Cold War. And above all, they were eager to roll back the New Deal and eradicate the scourge of labor union activism across the United States. In Hayek and his followers, these figures found the intellectual ammunition they needed to fight the post-war paradigm. Here we begin to see how Hayek's willingness to collaborate with the anti-New Deal faction began to have unforeseen consequences. From the moment of the study's creation at Chicago, Hayek was now forced to moderate influences of different factions within his international neoliberal movement, including the growing American libertarian contingent. But even Hayek, who was respected by every distinct group within the Mont Pelerin Society, couldn't always override the men providing the purse for his activities. In 1950, with only two years remaining in the free market studies duration, Leno threatened to remove Director from his leadership position if he didn't jettison the anti-monopoly ideas of Simons. It is at this moment that we begin to witness the perspective shifts of Director, Friedman, and Levi on monopoly power. Director's shift on monopoly power first appeared in his review of the book Unions and Capitalism by Charles Lindblom in 1950. In the review, Director boldly claimed that competitive forces located in the supply side of the market were capable of undoing monopoly power. According to Director, the corroding influence of competition has the effective tendency to destroy all types of monopoly, essentially taking the classical liberal notion that monopoly could suppress competition and flipping it on its head. To the ordo liberals, the notion of a monopoly that could spur competition would have appeared as an oxymoron, but Director doubled down on this idea in 1951, writing that the corporate form was ideal specifically because a corporation that achieved monopoly status would simultaneously trigger its own demise by inviting competitors to out-innovate that monopoly. Thus, even industries dominated by massive corporations were still perfectly competitive. Milton Friedman, director's brother-in-law, came to similar conclusions in the same time frame. Friedman is a massive figure in neoliberal history whose influence on economic thinking during the Cold War period is difficult to overstate. He was an economic advisor from the 1960s to the 1980s to Barry Goldwater and Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan, and also served as the president of the Mont Pelerin Society from 1970 to 1972. 
His major contributions to neoliberal thought begin with the highly intriguing article written in 1951 entitled Neoliberalism and Its Prospects. The first interesting aspect of this article is that it is one of the first and few writings in history that transparently identifies itself as neoliberal. It is also a remarkably helpful document for understanding the development of neoliberalism, but only up to this point in history. Like Hayek, Friedman insisted that laissez-faire liberalism and Keynesian intervention had both failed, highlighting the need for the new faith, as Friedman put it, of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism would accept the 19th century liberal emphasis on the fundamental importance of the individual, but it would substitute for the 19th century goal of laissez-faire as a means to this end, the goal of the competitive order. It would seek to use competition among producers to protect consumers from exploitation, competition among employers to protect workers and owners of property, and competition among consumers to protect the enterprises themselves. The state would police the system, establish conditions favorable to competition and prevent monopoly, provide a stable monetary framework, and relieve acute misery and distress. The citizens would be protected against the state by the existence of a free private market and against one another by the preservation of competition. But soon after the publication of this article, Friedman and the rest of the free market study diverged from their anti-monopoly roots. Friedman now claimed that monopoly persisted only when governments supported them. Like director, Friedman claimed that monopolies were highly visible and therefore targets for competition, but also argued that the effective power of monopoly over prices and wages tends to be considerably exaggerated, further portraying monopolies as relatively harmless. Friedman especially would become known throughout his career for his sanguine view of competition as a panacea for all kinds of economic difficulty, and his time in the free market study was the origin of that public stance. The last major contributor to the free market study was Edward Levi, a law professor at Chicago who would go on to be the university's president and then the U.S. Attorney General under the Ford administration later in life. In 1947, Levi publicly registered his opposition to monopoly power, stating, The fact of the matter is that there is enormous concentration in the American economy today and enormous amount of monopoly, a situation that he attributed to weak antitrust laws. By 1956, long after the free market study had concluded, Levi had arrived at the opposite conclusion, stating, Since economic theory demonstrates that the presence of monopoly is much more often alleged than confirmed, less rather than more regulation ought to be prescribed. Close to the end of the free market study, the new bent of the Chicago School was beginning to be noticed by others. The old Chicago economist Jacob Viner, who had left Chicago for Princeton in 1946, the same year that the free market study began, recalled his experience at a Volcker-funded conference organized by Director and Levi in 1951. Everything about the conference except the unscheduled statements and protests from individual participants were so patently rigidly structured, so loaded, that I got more amusement from the conference than from any other I ever attended. Even the source of the financing of the conference, as I found out later, was ideologically loaded. Leno must have felt he was receiving a tremendous return on his investment. The University of Chicago became the first of several important outposts for the Mont Pelerin Society and its wealthy sponsors to inject neoliberalism into the bloodstream of American academia and therefore into its politics. Leno was clearly committed to playing the long game even though he never got specifically what he asked for in the first place, which was an American road to serfdom. But after 16 long years of waiting, he actually did get what he asked Hayek for all those years ago. Only, it wasn't Hayek who delivered it, or even Aaron Director. It came in the form of Milton Friedman's most famous book, Capitalism and Freedom. Capitalism and Freedom, published in 1962 by University of Chicago Press, 18 years after the road to serfdom, is thoroughly neoliberal in the New Chicago style, and even reveals itself to be a Volcker product in the opening sentences of its original preface. This book is a long-delayed product of a series of lectures that I gave in June 1956 at a conference sponsored by the Volcker Foundation. The economic and political prescriptions contained within the book are some of the most clearly articulated neoliberal positions ever published. Political freedom is inextricably linked to, and derived from, economic freedom. The Bretton Woods system should be ended, its controls and fixed exchange rates discarded in favor of floating exchange rates. Federal expenditures destabilize the economy, contrary to the advice of Keynes. Public school systems ought to be privatized and replaced with vouchers. Fair employment practices laws inhibit the freedom of employers. Government intervention is the most common form of monopoly. The progressive income tax ought to be abolished. And the concept of social responsibility, that corporations ought to care about their communities and not just profit, is inimical to the capitalist system and can only lead to totalitarianism. 
And then, in the ultimate tribute to Leno, Friedman said the quiet part out loud. For advocacy of capitalism to mean anything, the proponents must be able to finance their cause. Radical movements in capitalist societies have typically been supported by a few wealthy individuals, a role of inequality in wealth and preserving political freedom that is seldom noted. As we can see, by the time capitalism and freedom arrived in 1962, neoliberalism had left the anti-monopoly positions of Simons and the order liberals in the dust. The ease with which the new Chicago economists had waved away concerns about monopoly power was emblematic of a new, comprehensive neoliberal worldview that blithely considered any analysis of political power irrelevant to economic analysis. In this new alternative universe, being an intellectual for hire was a badge of honor. Publishing research that philosophically justified the commodification of academic spaces not only protected freedom, but was simply good economics. Only 17 years after the end of World War II, neoliberalism had transformed from a questionable yet coherent response to Keynesian liberalism into a naked lust for consolidating wealth and power into the hands of those opposed to the post-war consensus. Aaron Director, who wrote the prefatory note of Simon's posthumously published work, Economic Policy for a Free Society, remembered his friend like this. In the work of Henry Simons, we find a combination of talents which is rare indeed. He was a first-rate economic theorist, he had an original mind, and he developed a distinguished literary style. We have to believe that the additional work which Henry Simons would have accomplished will ultimately be done by others. And yet, this is but small comfort for the personal loss of those of us he befriended. The work Simons' old friends like Director, Hayek, and Friedman did to honor him was to step over his corpse and then propel Chicago, and the rest of the world, into monopoly neoliberalism.